Sunbeams are the essence of poetry. Dreams, fantasy, fairy tales, sunbeams. And yet as esoteric and mystical as sunbeams are, they are the energy driver of the planet in a very visceral, physical, scientific, empirical sense. But if I asked you to go out and grab me some sunbeams, we know they're valuable, right? Well, grab me some. Could you bring them in here? Let's talk about sunbeams. Well, you, you know, children, they'll take you up on this. They'll dance around a little while and try to grab them, but, but they can't. The fact is that something as esoteric and mystical as sunbeams is captured by nature's photovoltaic array called photosynthesis in plants, through the chlorophyll of plants, and specifically grass. So the problem is that most of us in our modern culture are quite disconnected from grass. When I say grass, you know, people immediately think of lawns, golf courses, maybe a soccer field. But you're not thinking about the kind of grass that the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe found in the early 1700s when Governor Spotswood, the colonial governor of Virginia, sent his friends, dubbed the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe, I mean, they were British after all, sent them across the Blue Ridge. The British had bumped up here against the Blue Ridge. What was over Afton Mountain? What was over there? So he sent them over to discover what was there. And what they found, they wrote back, and they spent a couple of weeks, and they said, everywhere we rode in the Shenandoah Valley, we could take the grass and tie it in a knot above the horse's saddle. It was a magnificent silvopasture of elk, deer, passenger pigeons, prairie chickens, pheasant, turkey, and bison. Up to herds of three to four million. Captain Jim Bridger got behind a herd out in the Black Hills of Dakotas when he was sent out to explore it. Behind seven million bison. Now that's always intrigued me. You know, can you, uh, a lieutenant, could you come up here a minute please? Uh, sharpen your quill. Uh, start counting. Uh, one, two, you got that? Uh, yeah, two, three, yeah. Um, I, I, I have no idea, all right? But, 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 the, but, but the, the, the legacy of these migratory herds that were moved by both natural and Native American lit fires as a, as a landscape choreography, and these migratory patterns where they moved thousands of miles created the soils that we are currently mining today in the Midwest and that we already mined in Virginia up to three feet of topsoil washed off of Virginia during the European uh, uh, colonialization of the state and up until today and is still washing off today because we have turned this beautiful perennial based system into an annually based tillage system which is highly erosive. In the Shenandoah Valley where I live arguably three to five feet of topsoil have washed out and created the turbidity in today's Chesapeake Bay. But how does nature, so how does nature actually work? How nature works is Sunbeams come down, it's captured by photosynthesis and converted into biomass, into vegetable material. And if we look at the different kinds of plants, trees, bushes, and grass, intuitively we think, well, what's the most efficacious plant to collect these sunbeams and turn them into and sequester the carbon? Well, your mind tends to go to trees because you can see, oh, wow, look at all that biomass. But in actuality, trees are the least efficient. Brush is more efficient, uh, you know, bushes and brush and things like that. And then the pinnacle is grass. The fact is that if you, when you look at a forest, you're seeing 50 to 80, maybe 100 years of stored carbon all standing visible. You're not seeing 80 years of grass visible at one time. Now, the grass goes through a growth cycle, just like us, just like all living things, it goes through a growth cycle. It starts slow, and then it accelerates, and then it goes into senescence. So the three stages of grass I call diaper stage. So, so right here in this, in, in this pot, I have freshly eaten Diaper stage. This is infant grass. It's, it's, just been, it's just been grazed and it's coming back. 
Here, I have teenage grass, okay? Juvenile, fast growth grass. Remember when you could eat a half a gallon of ice cream and it didn't go on your hips? This is <laughs> juvenile grass. And then we come into, you know, more juvenile, but you see it's starting to brown down and eventually it goes to what I call nursing home grass, <laughs> okay? Senescence, the end. The role of the herbivore in nature, if you've ever thought about it, and the reason I'm concentrating on this is because herbivores have gotten a bad rap in recent days. You know, cows, climate change, and all that uh, stuff. You see, the data points to study the effect of cows on the environment are all coming from a position that does not respect and honor the herbivore in its classic role. The role of the herbivore and the reason the planet is so full of herbivores, think about Africa, think about, you know, South America, the, you know, alpacas, think about Indochina, you know, yaks. I mean, they're all over the place. Reindeer, caribou, there's a lot of herbivores, groundhogs, prairie, you know, everything. <laughs> is because without them, this biomass would simply turn into senescent material and just volatilize and die and quit growing. So the role of the herbivore in nature is to take this as it approaches senescence, prune it back just like a viticulturalist would prune a vineyard or an orchardist would prune an apple tree. Does anyone think ill of an orchardist? Why are you pruning your apple tree? You know, no, we think that's good. We think that's good stewardship. And that's exactly what the herbivores did. So they pruned this back to restart this rapid biomass uh, um, production. Without them, it stops. The whole program stops. Now the problem is, how do we duplicate this if we don't have migratory patterns? If we don't have 4 million buffalo in a herd? If we don't have... 10 million wolves chasing them, if we don't have fire, if we don't have the magnificent, amazing choreography of nature, how do we duplicate this amazing principle that hydrated, built soil, fed, you know, all the mycorrhizae and the actinomycetes and, and built the soils that we're still mining today? How do we duplicate that if we have a system of private land ownership and, and all that? Well, we do it with high-tech electric fencing. Space age microchipped electric fencing. It's an almost invisible to the eye, and yet we can encircle a herd of a thousand cows with almost an invisible wire that you would never see. I mean, visitors to our farm I have to watch the wire, you know, they walk into ah, you know, and so I mean, it's practically invisible. But because it's such a strong psychological barrier, the cows learn and they can see way better than us. In fact, they can see all the way around their heads. So well, except for 30 degrees on their back end. So they can see this. They know it's there. And it allows us to duplicate this mobbed movement that they would have had in eons before we had private land. And so we call this, we call this mob stocking herbivorous solar conversion lignified carbon sequestration. And so as the biomass gets to this point, we prune it back with the herbivore and then it begins to grow. And as the leaf area begins to get more and more chlorophyll, it, it, the growth accelerates and accelerates so that from here to here is, let's just say for, for sake of discussion, from here to here, this time period is 20 days. From here to here, the time period is only 10 days, all right? So it's accelerating and then it, and then it slows off. So wh what we're doing is using the herbivore, in this case a cow, it could be a sheep or a goat or whatever, but in this case a cow, we're using the animal in its historic role using high-tech electric fencing in order to leverage and stimulate the biomass production. The bottom line is that in Augusta County, where I live, which is over the mountain, in Augusta County, the average pasture, the biomass production, if you dry it down and you weigh it, 
the biomass production on the average acre of grass in Augusta County is 2,500 pounds per year. On our farm, we've been there almost 60 years. We've never planted a seed. We've never bought a bag of chemical fertilizer. And on our farm, we average well over 10,000 pounds per acre. You know, we're all familiar with the tension between ecology and economy and, and that there's a battle and we can't be environmentally sensitive unless we sacrifice the economy and we can't be economically viable unless we sacrifice the environment. And I'm here to present to you the notion as a fact that we can actually have both. But what we have to do is manage things completely differently. You see, the data points that impugn the lowly cow as the destroyer of the planet have the wrong object uh, uh, to, to, you know, uh, to have a problem with. The problem is not the herbivore. The herbivore is doing what she's always done. She's, you know, a four-wheel drive, portable sauerkraut vat turning... <laughs> Turning carbohydrate, fermenting it into, you know, meat and milk, nutrient-dense food. She's doing exactly what she was supposed to do. But she's not being managed the way the wild herds and the migratory patterns were managed, where they moved and they vacated areas long enough for the forage to go through this magnificent 50, 60, 70-day physiological expression cycle and then be pruned back and harvested at the appropriate time. In fact, what happens is that on most pastures, even at this, the grass never even can grow to this point, it's kept very, very short. So it's pruned 20 times in a season, and you add up all those little couple hundred pounds a time, and it comes out to about 2,500 pounds per year. Instead, we let the forage come way up here to full physiological expression by denying access, we move the cows every day to a new spot, letting everything else rest and go through this rapid accumulation cycle. And what it means is that we triple, quadruple, and even quintuple the amount of forage that can produce on a certain area. Now, that cow is dropping 50 pounds of goodies out her back end every day. <laughs> so just think about what happens when you change it from... 4,000 pounds of manure and urine per acre to 20,000 pounds of manure and urine per acre. Suddenly, you have soil building capacity. So here we are, here we are not only harvesting way more, but we're sequestering way more carbon. We're using the animal in its historic role. We're honoring and respecting the cowness of the cow. When you feed the herbivore foreign things like grain and you lock them up in a feedlot and you do all the kinds of desecrating things, I mean the U.S. duh, I call it the U.S. duh, for, for 30 years laughed at us for doing this. They said, grind up dead cows, feed them back to cows, you know. And, and we were branded Luddites and anti-progressives, anti-science, you know. Go on, get with the program, Salatin, you know. What's this grass stuff? Forty years later, there's this sudden global, uh, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to have done that. <laughs> and it's beyond me why we still give these, uh, these, these um, sophisticated agents of our culture the freedom to tell us what to eat and how to eat. And so, the what if of this. Just, just imagine if all of our neighbors did this instead of continuous grazing where they just turn, you know, 50 cows into 100 acres and just leave them all year and the grass can never get above infant, you know, what I call diaper grass. And it just sits there always kind of, you know, in, in like half of first gear. And can, you know, there's a lot of analogies we can uh, uh, make here, but, but the point is that, that the grass never, it never accelerates. It, it, it can't because it's, are they ever going to get out of diapers? You know, well, it's the same way the forage is. But if we, if we control it so that the animals only access a tiny little spot each day and create a mosaic pattern, 
guess what? Now we've got moles and voles. We've got bird nesting sites. We've got, we've got a continuous mosaic of pollination of, of blossoms, red clover, white clover, and dandelions uh, that, that, that are, are for pollinators. You've got all sorts of uh, uh, growth going on below the ground because now we have this, this biology, the, the, the soil um, cools down because it's got all this nice cool mulch that's transpiring, oxygenating, and you know, I'm inhaling the oxygen out of this plant, and then, and it's inhaling my carbon dioxide. I mean, isn't that cool? Okay, and and tomorrow it goes through a frog, and then it goes into a goldenrod, and then it comes back in, you know, and it's this wonderful connection. And so, what if, what if UVA would serve this kind of meat instead of the concentration camp meat. What if McDonald's served this? What if Burger King served this? What if you ate this? And what if I ate this as as a blessed way to participate in the most healing, amazing, nurturing choreography of nature by respecting the cowness of the cow, using her as an herbivore in her historic role, and participating in the nurturing of the planet. Thank you for letting me share something that's very simple with you. Thank you so much.